the databases and then the basics and the basics of category theory. So in particular, the topic will be at a, a sort of understanding this table. So on one hand, I want to tell you what a category is, what a map between category is, categories are, which are known as functors. I'll tell you uh, a bit. We'll talk about natural transformations very briefly and um, talk about universal constructions. On the other side, we have we want to understand the way in which a database schema is an example of a, a category. Um, and in particular, uh, an instance of a database is an example of a functor. Database instance. Then we'll be able to talk about relationships between uh, Sort of, sort of mappings between database instances as natural transformations. Um, so these are sort of like uh, relationships between databases, which are short for database instances. And then the, the interesting part is that after setting up sort of this background, we can give these in this context, we can talk about universal constructions. Um, and these universal constructions correspond, again, to, to friends we know from, well, either working with databases or what you might intuitively want to, to do when you think about working with databases. So things like um, migrating data um, or querying your databases. Okay. <coughs> so, this isn't, the, the way to read this is that um, these things can be seen examples of certain types of, of these things. So, I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna begin just by giving you some examples of, of databases. And, And we'll think about how to think of databases. Yeah. Um, so, databases, and then this is sort of example one. Um, so I'm going to go through two examples, uh, which which David has written up in the notes. So. The first example, uh, a database is really a bunch of interlocking tables. Uh, so you might have one table called employee, um, and employees have characteristics <coughs> like uh, names, name, they work in a department, um, and they have managers. So we might pull this table out. So that we're going to give each of our employees just some sort of key. They're going to have names like um, Alan, Ruth, and Chris. Um, Alan is going to work in some department we're going to call 101. Ruth is also going to work in the same department. Chris will work in a different department. And then they'll have managers. So uh, Alan can be managed by Ruth, and Ruth is managed by herself, and Chris manages herself too. Um, on the other hand, these things now, this thing refers to another table where we have, uh, which are departments. Um, so we have department 101, 102. 101 can be sales. Um, so Alan works in sales. So this is the name of the department. Uh, and each department can, say, have a secretary. So we've decided that. Alan is the secretary of the sales department, so there's a one here, to refer to Alan, and um, Chris can work in IT and be a secretary of that department. So, a database instance, instance is a bunch of tables, but these, 
these tables obey these relationships that I've been describing. Right? So we might want to, to map out these relationships to make sure our, our database is somehow well formed so that uh, our employees, the names of employees aren't departments. Um, so, so we can write down sort of, sort of what's known as a database schema which these tables must obey. So firstly, how do we do this? We're going to say for each table, there's a node. Um, so there's a node called employee and a node called department. Um, and then if we look at the structure a bit more, we not only refer, um, we, there are not only sort of internal references, so uh, this, this column here refers to this table, there are also external references, things to absolute things that have uh, meaning in the real world, like Alan. Alan is a person, and we want that to remain Alan. Whereas an internal reference is, is sort of, uh, as long as it's internally consistent, we're fine. So if we change the, the name of the sales department to 103, if we change these two numbers to 103 and this to 103, then we're fine. So uh, I'm also going to add these things we call, say, data types, and I'm going to add an extra node for each of the external data types. So in particular, uh, it's enough that we have data of type string, and I'll add a node for string. And then the relationships that these table interlocking tables must obey are things like, uh, so for each employee, we get a name. What is a name? It's a type of string. So there's a map from employee to string called name, um, or at least an arrow. For which we'll later interpret as a map. Um, employees have, the manager of an employee is also an employee. So we have a, a loop here that says we can uh, find the manager of an employee, and that's also an employee. Right? Uh, employees work in a department. Um, departments have secretaries, which should be employees. and. Departments of names, which are strings. So this is the beginnings of a database schema. But there's also a bit more structure we want for our database to be uh, to be well behaved. And this is this is in that we want uh, certain relationships to be preserved. So. Uh, For example, we want the secretary. It's, it's good business practice if we have the secretary of a department also working in that same department. You don't want the secretary of sales in IT. Uh, so we're, we're going to write down some further rules we want our database to obey, such as if we start in a department um, and take the secretary of that department and check which department they work in, then. This is the same as just getting the name of the department. We also want, say, the, the manager of an employee to work in the same department of that, as that employee. So I'll say that if we start with an employee um, and we, uh, we can either take the department, so say Alan works, works in sales, or works. we can. Let's say works in. Sorry, which one? This one? The one you just wrote, depth? Ah, works in. It should say works in. Thanks. Employee works in. Um, so, we can take an employee, check which department they work in, or we can take that employee, figure out who manages them, um, and then check where their manager works. Um, and we should get the same result. So, this is, is what we're calling a database schema, but it's also a very basic example of a category. And that categories have all the same features. They have these objects or entities. They have a web of relationships between these entities. And they have a rules for composing these entities together with equations that say, when we compose certain things, they're going to end up equal to certain other things. OK. <coughs> 
So I have, why can't you express manager as an employee in your, you, you said this is a graph or this is a relationship here. Uh -huh. Why is it, it can, can it not be expressed otherwise? So you want an extra class that says, here's a table of managers. Right. Or, or, no, no, no. You say department is secretary, works in his department. That's a, uh -huh. a, a, however you're classifying that as a rule, right? Is that the, on the right here? I, right. I guess I'm, I'm curious. So do you want me to add extra rules? Or? Yeah, I think I'm trying to say, is okay. why, why are why you... Why did I stop here? Right. Why did you stop here? Is it, I mean, is it shorthand or... Um, this is the schema I wanted to draw. Okay. Uh, so this is... This is the, the company that I'm managing, and if my managers don't obey nice things like my manager, I mean, I guess my managers have to be employees. I guess uh, I'm just saying, you, you, you're not explicitly <coughs> putting it here in, as... That a manager is an, ex an employee? Yeah, right. It is oh, because so, that's, oh. the, that's the self-loop there. No, right. but it, can you not encode the self-loop as a rule? Uh, it's, it's a different sort of structure. So the, I guess, I guess, that's I guess we have this sort of how do you distinguish the between the two? In English, we have this, this problem because uh, a manager is both like a noun and sort of uh, some sort of relational thing, right? So there, there are pe certain people are managers, but also people have managers. Uh, and so I haven't explicitly created some sort of class in this, in this database that says these are my managers. Okay. But there is this, this thing um, that says if I give you an employee, or if you give me an employee, I can tell you who the manager is. Um, do you wanna? I guess maybe it's worth mentioning that the columns of the table, there's five besides the ID columns. There's three on the first and two on the second. There's exactly the same number of arrows. There's a one, two, three, four, five arrows also. There's one arrow for every, every column. So that's kind of a nice feature that turns a database schema, like just in terms of the tables, directly into the graph you would okay. draw. Yeah, good point. Okay, so we don't only want to store data in, in whatever format and whatever sort of knowledge structure we've decided to store things in. We want to relate data. So I'm going to give a slightly simpler uh, database schema, a pair of database schemas, and talk about relationships between them. Um, as to shade into discussion of functoriality. Uh, so this is example two. Um, I'm going to just say I'm managing an airline, or say I'm an airline company. Um, and I have, I'm going to have two tables for economies of keeping track of tickets that have been sold. And I'm going to have two tables, one is going to be the economy tickets and the first class tickets. So let's say we've sold two economy tickets and they have things like a price, which we'll say is $50. Um, and for the price, you get some sort of seat, a position on the plane. So let's say this one is a you know, 10A and this one is 15B. Um, similarly, we sell the first class ticket, which we'll call just one, uh, for the price of uh, $500, somebody can afford that, and for that sum, you get to sit in the first row. All right. So this is a way of, of representing, this is a system for storing data, uh, and there's going to be a schema associated with this. Um, can anyone shout out what this is, <coughs> given the hints from over there and David's comment. Go ahead. Two, two objects, one labeled econ and the other the first. Right. Um, a map from econ to some data type, um, right. which refers to the price. So we can just okay. call them all strings. If you so like. we'll, call, well, we'll call them quantities, dollars, dollars okay. or something. So this will be price. And um, then a data type for seed. Right, the data. So that's just, they will be strings. And then an arrow from econ to that, mm -hmm. and the um, symmetric arrows from over the first class. Yes. Great. Oops. This is price. I call it position, I guess. So let's continue with that. Okay. So, say I'm American Airlines and I've sold these tickets and I've stored <coughs> them in this format. Um, but Say this is a code share flight with Qantas, and Qantas doesn't store separate tables for economy and first class. They just they just have seats. They uh, or some sort of structure that that records seats. So that database schema looks like 
case. We have a seat, um, and to each seat we associate a price um, and a position. Uh, this is going to be a string. So one thing I might want to do is now, one thing I'm going to need to do if I'm going to sort of be able to, to figure out who gets what seats or how much the seats were sold for at the Qantas land is to map, uh, to be able to migrate data in this format to data in this format. Um, and so I'm not going to be able to do, do that for free. I need to be able to, to say at least what the relationship is between these, these formats or these, these schemas are. So I'm going to say that prices map to prices, strings map to strings, and then, uh, well, both economy and first are types of C. And so now there's a construction I can do to get the, the table, this, this data migrated into this format. Um, and that construction is, is really just the obvious thing. Uh, there's a table, one, a single table here, because we only have one internal <coughs> of node, and it's called seat. Um, and to each seat, we associate a price and a position. Um, and so, and how are we going to fill out this table? Well, everything over every, uh, we, we have each of these seats. We have the first economy seat, the second economy seat, and the first class seat, and they have prices. <coughs> and positions. Um, but what is going to be relevant is that this construction is an example of some sort of universal construction that can be derived from just specifying this map, which turns out to be a functor between these two categories. So it's a map of, of database schemas that preserves sufficient structure. And the point of taking this categorical viewpoint towards databases and, and trying to understand what databases are in terms of categories is that through specifying some sort of small thing, we then get this big library of things called universal constructions that say, just do the obvious thing from this data. And it will construct, in this case, the sort of migration from that format to this format. It can also represent things like queries and, and all sorts of database operations that you really want to do in practice. Uh, in this way. Uh, but not only that, because we have such compact representations, it gives good reasoning properties. So you can make sure your databases are secure, um, that is, that they're, <coughs> they're sort of migrating data in the way that you actually want them to, to migrate. Um, OK. So with that sort of introduction, let me tell you what a category is. Definition. Um, let me be rather formal, and then we'll give a bunch of examples like last week. The <coughs> category is uh, comprises a let's just say collection. Uh, so let's call this category C. Is a collection which we're going to call the objects of C of what we're going to call objects, um, where every pair of objects. Objects for pairs of objects, a a set which I'm going to call C A B of morphisms, and then a composition rule. Um, so, sorry, did I switch from A? So for all objects A B C. function from CAB times CBC to CAC. Uh, okay, They're gonna, it's going to obey some conditions, but let me sort of give you some intuition for what's going on here first. We have a collection of objects. Um, there are these things. We have a collection of morphisms. So for every pair of objects, we can talk about the, the set of arrows or the different arrows between these two objects. So here are the sets are either 
have one arrow or empty. Um, and then we can't see the composition rule here, but for every pair, uh, for every three objects, if I have an arrow from here to here and an arrow from here to here, this thing says I can get for free um, a map from here to here. Uh, OK. <coughs> so this must obey certain rules. Um, so th there are two conditions. Uh, the first is the identity axiom, and the second is the associativity axiom. So these are sort of the first examples of ideas of coherence, which I'll sort of emphasize throughout this talk. Uh, but the identity axiom says that uh, there is, for each object, an arrow on that object that is basically do nothing, according to this composition rule. So for all objects, um, there exists some special thing in the arrows from A to A, such that uh, OK, so I'm going to call this map composition. So I'm going to say that uh, if, if we have uh, some, some first arrow f and some second arrow g, then we write the composite so f then g, f dot g. Um, so in particular, if I have, if this one is the identity, um, so such that for all, <coughs> sorry, I should, I'll introduce a bit more notation too. Um, so f is a map. So here, we're going to write, if f is in a, b, we're going to write f is a map from a to b. So a is, a is a map, identity on a is a map from a to a. Um, and if we have uh, such that for all f from a to b, if we take the identity on a and then compose with f, we get, we haven't done anything, so we get back f. Um, and the same on the other side. Uh, <coughs> so plus if we have a map from f from uh, b to a, then if we compose f, then the identity on a, then we also return, uh, we haven't done anything, we get back f. So. Uh, plus symmetric condition. Uh, and right, no, symmetric condition. Okay. Uh, the associativity law says that if we have maps, uh, so we have map, a map F A for F from A, uh, A to B, a map G from B to C, and a map H from um, C to D, then it doesn't matter. We, so we have a way for composing these pairwise. So we can create this thing FG and then compose that with H, or we can create this thing GH and compose that with F. Um, and this just says that's equal. So we say F dot G dot H is equal to uh, so for all this, we have this condition that f dot g dot h is equal to f dot g dot h. Um, OK. So that is an abstract definition. Now let's talk about examples and, and how this relates, for example, to the post sets we saw uh, on Tuesday. Want to take questions? Anyway? People, some people might be confused. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sure. Questions? I was just confused. Yes, yeah, so you have identity A as an element of the C A A, but F is also an element of like that same thing, like C A A or C A B. So how can you have like identity operating on? Or you're saying, is that a composition of identity in F? Yes, that's a oh, composition okay, of identity, yeah. So, so, perhaps, sorry, I should have maybe done this diagrammatically. So, we can think of morphisms as boxes with an input out type and an output type, right? So, 
these things are objects, this is a morphism. And the composition rule says if we have an object uh, box that runs from A to B, and a box that runs from B to C, we can connect them. And then we get a new box that runs from A to C. Right. Uh, identity says that there's this special box called identity, which basically just looks like nothing. So then if we compose this with f, um, it says we get this box that is the same as composing this with f, which really is just f with a longer line out the front, so it's just f again. Um, so that's, in, in that sense, the identity sort of uh, gives some sort of coherent interpretation of having a, the, being able to vary the length of the line. Um, and the associativity law just says that if I connect three boxes together, and I'm allowed to do that because the types match up, then this, you might want to try and interpret this diagram in two different ways according to your composition law. Um, but what the associativity law says, it doesn't matter which way you try and interpret this. You just sort of glom these all together in any order you like, and it has a unique interpretation, and it will always give the same result. Um, so, the way that you've got it written, um, if this was regular function composition, the uh, the domain and the range of f, g, and h uh -huh. are swapped. Are we in, uh, are we interpreting this as regular function composition? I'm, we're not interpreting this as regular function composition, <laughs> although we, we might later. But these aren't functions. These are just na these are just formal symbols. But do they like um, act to the right? So like h maps from c. So to I'm I'm using a, a if we tried to interpret this as function composition, I would be using a reverse notation. Okay, great. Er I think the usual interpretation is that the domain and range are, are usual, but the uh, order of operands for the composition operation is swapped in our yes. notation here. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. It makes it so you can read the string diagrams, right? F yes. G reads from right to from left to right. Yeah. Basically. And so it's called diagrammatic got, order of composition. Okay. We've got function composition notation wrong about 150 <laughs> years ago, and we haven't managed to correct it, and it really sucks. <laughs> is every time I write a paper, I have to make this decision about which way to do it. Uh, the right way or the conventional way. Anyway, so example one, uh, posets. Um, so how are posets categories? Well, posets are categories uh, where our, our collection of objects is just the underlying set of the poset. Uh, a, a set of morphisms <coughs> is not a set, it's just the answer to the question, is A less than B, right? So, um, so if, if A is less than B, then we say there is a morphism, and if A is, is not less than B, we say the set is empty, there's, there's no morphism, there's no way to get from A to B. Um, and then composition just says that if we have a way, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then we get something in AC. So that means that A is less than C. Uh, so let me sort of write that down. Um, oh, so here's, a, here's an example of a first set from last time. That's a Hasse diagram. Um, so we have, so here uh, we have four objects, one, two, three, four. We have actually more than um, four morphisms. We have <coughs> these relationships, but we also have that A, or say this, this element here is less than itself, um, which was a requirement in the poster. So we get all these identity maps that say this is less than itself and this is less than itself, or uh, which is precisely the identity relation. And then we get um, sort of uh, an arrow from here to here, saying that this is, is less than this. Um, is that clear enough? Okay. So, so posets can be thought of as categories with uh, posets are categories with at most one 
morphism. Oh yeah, I've got the morphism uh, between any two objects. So in C A. Oh, why don't you take the transitive closure here? If you really, otherwise there's no way to say that it's not really a post set because you can't really say that it's transitive. So, so we're well, using the convention from last time where first set means pre order. Uh, but what? Pre order is transitive. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's just the Hasa diagram. Sorry. Right? Yeah, it's, it's just the Hasa diagram. So this yeah, is but if you're going to identify it with a category, I think you want to take it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so from this Hasa diagram, we take the sort of transitive closure of this, the relation suggested by these arrows, and that forms a pre order. Um, and that pre order is a, a category in which every object. In which between any two objects there's at least most one more of them. Um. <coughs> okay. So, uh, example two uh, monoids. So, these are, are categories with exactly one object. Okay. So let me be a bit more concrete. Uh, what's an example of a monoid? Well, uh, so a very concrete example is uh, something like, say, a paint program on the computer. So here we have one object, which is just <coughs> the we might think of as a canvas state. And then we have operations we can do, like uh, draw a circle in the top left, or, or another one is to draw a square in the top right. Um, and if we take two operations and we do them successfully, we can draw a square and draw a circle. Um, and so that, that creates the, the composite object, uh, the composite morphism. So draw a circle and square. So um, another example of a monoid is uh, another sort of more mathematical familiar example is just the natural numbers. So here, we might think of having one object and a morphism for 0, and a morphism for 1, and a morphism for 2, um, and so on. Right. And so we can compose these morphisms. Uh, we don't have to worry about the objects being of the same type, because there's only one object. Uh, but if we compose <coughs> 0 and 1, then we add them and we get 1. Or if we compose 1 and 2, we get a new morphism 3. Um, so <coughs> that's it. Um, so in, in general, we can sort of proceed uh, to construct a category from, from any sort of structure of the sort. So the real numbers form a, a category with one object, or any group you know forms a category with one object, or there's a, I mean, there's a the trivial there's a trivial category which we're going to call one, um, which has one object and one morphism, and this morphism is just the identity morphism. So if we compose, take one composed with one, we get one again. Um, For groups, with the Cayley graph gives you another category? <coughs> the Cayley graph of a group uh, gives you a category in that it gives you a post set. Um, so there are. But you can label the. Um, uh, essentially use the same labels or set for the. or uh, class, if you will, for the morphisms as you do for the objects. And then you have the transformations that way. That doesn't work. Yeah, it works. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So you get what's called a. every morphism has an inverse in that case. Yeah. You go if forward you and back. You, also could you could do the same thing with a monoid, presumably. Mm -hmm. So you would have a similar. Yeah. So it's just a different. I don't know. Yeah, right. there's a Cayley graph right, for monoids. Right, you can take a graph for monoids. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm? Is this like the associate group void to it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, what did you say? I was asking if it's the asso it's a group void associated to a group. <coughs> yes. Well, it's the it's it's tractable the, group the, void. The, the, that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So more, more related to database schemas. Uh, so we saw you know, last time how you can take a, an arbitrary graph and construct the, as you said, the transfer closure to construct a, a pre-order, which is a category of, of this sort. We can also do this thing called construct a free category on a graph. Uh, so example three, um, free categories on graphs. So these are also called path categories. So let me give you, so say we take a graph um, that just looks like this. Um, then the objects of this thing are the vertices. And then the morphisms are paths. So, so morphisms from A to B, where A and B are vertices, are just paths from A to B. Um, and in particular, we have the zero length path. So if we start at A, we can sort of have a path that does nothing <coughs> and also ends at A. Um, and this will be the identity morphism. Uh, given two paths, so if I have a path from A to B and a path from B to C, so I have a path here to here and a path here to here, then there is a path from here to here. So we have a, a composition rule. Um, so perhaps I'll, I'll let you discuss uh, by drawing, say, this category. So I'm going to call this category 2. Um, 3. I'm going to call this category 3. Uh, and we're going to say how many How many morphisms are there in three? In the category three. So perhaps I'll give you, you know, three minutes to discuss that and then we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> How did you know it became one and six? I was just, 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 I knew there were six things there. Oh, okay. So it was, you know, all close to exhaustive. But yes, that's right, I forgot about the self-revelation. Well, the um, zero link half. Zero was not a search. That's right. Okay, so does anyone want to shout out how many morphisms that there are in three? One vote for six. One vote for six. Two votes for six. I'll do six. One vote for six. You've got six? This is totally blind, but I've got six. Do you want to try and unblind that by giving a reason? Three of them are the self ones. Right, so there's the trivial parts on each object. Uh, two for the one to the two and the two to the three, uh -huh. whatever, and then there's all together. Right, there's one path from there to there. So there are, there are six paths in this thing. So that's a category with three objects and six morphisms. Okay, so one thing you might do um, is start giving what are called presentations of categories. So we can construct, given any graph, you can construct some sort of free category where the objects are the vertices and the morphisms are the paths. 
Um, but categories are more than graphs. We can start associating relationships between paths and forcing two paths to be equal, like we did in the, the database schema down here. Okay. So, do you think it'd be worth mentioning that the two categories you drew up there were all already free categories? Or I guess yeah. I'm okay. So that's a, that's a good point. So I, I won't ask you how to, well the construction. I'll just say. Uh, so this category here, the natural numbers, is the path category on on this graph. Uh, why is that? It has one object. So the vertices are the objects. It has one object, one vertex, one object. Uh, the paths. We can go around this loop as many times as we like. So if we go around, if we just don't go around at all, we have uh, the identity map or this zero element here. If we go around at once, we have one. If we go around at five times, we have five. Right. And if we compose these two paths, so if we go around, what's the path where we get that we get if we go around at three times, then go around at five more times? It's the path that does this loop eight times. So it's, it's the morphism eight. So the composition rule is the same as well. Right. So the natural numbers are the free category on, on this, this graph here. One is the free category on this graph here. Right. There are the only path here is the trivial path, so it's only going to have one morphism, so that's that thing over there. Um, and we can do the trivial path more times if we like, but it's always going to be trivial. Okay, so um, example four, I'm going to call. I have a question here. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, yellow example you just gave, that one uh, loop has to correspond to the identity, does it not? Or this one loop? Yeah, or is there another loop implicit in there that is the identity? There's the implicit zero, okay. the, okay. the right. like zero length path. He's on, in the yellow, he's drawing graphs. Okay. Okay. And on the in the white, he was drawing categories of, right. uh, over there on the top row there. Okay. So when you take start with the graph, so let's do it you start right. asking what are all the paths in this graph. Then you get your category okay. back. Okay, thank you. Um, so, question. Yeah. So, what makes these categories free, or what does it mean for it to be free? Uh, it means there are no equations. So. That leads into your next topic, no? Yes. Um, there are no constraints. Yes. So how do I how do I describe uh, morphisms in these categories? I write them down as paths, right? Um, and then it's never the case that I have two paths that are considered equal to each other as two distinct paths that are considered equal to each other as morphisms in this category. Okay. So I'll never be able to write sort of uh, some path A is equal to some, well, yeah, some path F is equal to some other path G, right? So in, in that sense, they're free. Uh, okay, so for example four, I'm just gonna give an example of a category that's not free, and I'm gonna call it the commutative square. Um, so, Here's a graph, and it can construct a free category in this graph, and it would have four objects. Um, and, if I, G, H, K, and it would have uh, 10 morphisms. Um, so there is a morphism that is a zero length path in each object. There are these four one length one paths, and then two length two paths. Right. <coughs> but I might want to enforce the constraint that if we do F, then H, we're going to consider this the same as doing g then k. Um, so now I have a category and it's got, uh, so if, if I give this morphism a name, uh, <coughs> equal path. Actually, no, I won't give it a name. Um, I'll, I'll just say that there, there are only nine morphisms in this category. Um, so there's only one morphism now from here to here instead of two. Okay. And so this is not a free category? Yes, so this is not a free category. Um, 
But this is much closer to one of these database instances, because what I want to say in, in this sort of setting now is that uh, if I <coughs> if think of this as an identity morphism uh, on department. So uh, doing department then, or starting with uh, doing secretary then works in, it's going to give me one morphism, but there's also a morphism that is just stay, stay in the department you start with. And what I want to say is that those two morphisms are going to be the same in this. So whenever you try and construct some sort of uh, set of tables, these, these two things have to be the same. OK. Um, so example, another class of examples uh, <coughs> is sort of set and categories you might find in math. Uh, so set is the category. Uh, where the objects are sets, as you might guess, and the morphisms are functions. So let's check what this means in terms of the definition. Well, and we could even do it in terms of these pictures. So if I have a, a function from some set A to some set B, and a function from some set B to some set C, I can compose them and get a function from the set A to the set C. Okay. Um, and then this says is this law here. So given any set, there's also an identity function, which um, if we have a set A, there's a set function from A to A that you give me an element of A and I give you the same element back. Um, that's the identity in this category. And then um, the associativity law is just a fact about functions. Yeah. Set is free? Set is not a free category. Oh. No, no, it's not a free category. Um, why, it's, why is it not a free category? Well, for example, uh, you have maps <coughs> like, uh, say I have, uh, Some map from A to, well, let's just have a map from A to A, right? Say I have this map from A to A, and I do it again, um, I get back this map, the identity map. So if I call this map S for swap, <coughs> then I have the equation that S composed with S is equal to the identity. So that's two different paths from A to itself that are the same. Yes. So, so there's, yeah, there's equations between, between composites. In general, there's, I mean, and this is historically how category theory arises, uh, for every class of mathematical object, you have an associated notion of, of morphism. So for sets, um, <coughs> the, the sort of right notion of map between sets seems to be function. And then for groups, you might, uh, the notion of relationship between group is something like a group homomorphism, or is a group homomorphism, or between vector spaces, it's linear maps, or between topological spaces, it's continuous maps. So if you're familiar with all of these things, all of these things are, are very classical examples of categories. Um, I think I'll leave examples of categories there. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Can I just clarify if there's some so <coughs> some notion of inverse inverse morphism, then then that that category is not free. No, uh, that it's certainly true that if there is a notion of inverse morphism, then we start have relationship. We start having equations like f composed with f inverse is the identity, and that's, that's, that's that means it's not free. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in in general, there are uh, other categories that are not free that still have. Uh, sorry, the categories that are, are don't don't have inverses that are still not free. Yeah. So yeah. But once it has inverses, it's not free. Right. Unless it only has <laughs> inverses for the identities. It's a discrete cat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want to tell you now what a functor is. So three is functor. So a functor is a way of reinterpreting one category in another. Um, 
so uh, definition if we have some categories C and D. Um, a functor f from C to D um, is so for each object of A, uh, for each object of C, uh, an object. Uh, f of a in in D, so it's a, a it's a function from <coughs> it's a function from objects. Uh, actually, sorry, I should write this way. Oh no, okay. Um, and then for all uh, pairs of objects, we get a, a way of taking morphisms uh, from A to B to morphisms from the images of the objects. Um, so we call this function also, if, if, it, if there's a morphism f from A to B, it takes it to a map named f of f, um, such that, and this is the important condition, uh, well, there are two conditions, such that we have an identity condition which says that f of the identity on each object is equal to the identity on the image of the object. And then we have the important I think we called them id before. Oh, sorry. And then if we have two morphisms that we can compose, so the image of f composed of g is equal to the image of f composed of the image of g. Um, Okay, that's again very abstract, but let me give some examples, and especially <coughs> to these path categories. Um, another category. We called this from three before. Um, so a functor from two to three says that for every object in two, I need to give an object in three. So I'm going to, for this object, I'm going to say it will map it to this object. And for this object, um, well, we're going to say we map it to this object. Um, and now you must do this in a way such that for each arrow, it turns into an arrow over here. For each morphism over here, it turns into a morphism over here. So there's an identity morphism on, on this object here, so it goes to, and it has to go to the identity morphism on here. Um, there's a morphism from this object to this object, from A to B, say. So we're going to send that to a morphism over here, and there's only one choice. It's got to go to this, morph, uh, to this arrow here. Um, so this thing maps to that thing. And that defines a functor. Um, so perhaps maybe uh, we could also count functors from two to three. And, we'll, and everyone can get used to that definition. Do you want us to do that now? Yeah, sorry, I'll give you about another sort of two, three minutes to discuss that. And then so <laughs> how many functors from yeah. two to three? Good question. Um, want to discuss it? Is there an easier way to do it? Let's slow this. 
So we need a place for our objects to go. So, but, yeah. But don't you this is not just the the objects are the dots. The morphisms are the path. Yeah, this is the but when you say nine, oh, oh, I see you said that. Okay. So my two dots. I'm thinking about I don't think I'm thinking about that. Okay, fine. So, this is the direction of the objects. So, the idea of these are those things that have to be in that relationship. So, we have to find any mapping of objects and any mapping of of because you already have the that maintains identity and composition. So the two objects can go to any two objects in three. There's like lots of maybe nine different choices. But then every arrow in two needs to go to some path. Every path is going to one path. And there's none that go backwards. There's no possibility in three to go backwards. But doesn't that constrain it? Or does yeah. Oh, okay. so there aren't all nine functors. Okay. Okay. So, so, yeah. I can't go But I get, I get the nine. Yeah. It's not nine. It's not nine. Yeah. Yeah. There are all three people right now. Because you do have to get first. Okay. Do people have. Do people want to shout out some answers? Or ideas? Same. The same. The same. Why are they the same? The only, you know, the only thing you have to do is map the right. the arrow, and so you only have to count the arrows. Right. So this this constraint um, here that basically uh, arrows must map to arrows, and the the domain in the codomain. Sorry, arrows have this. So if I have an arrow from A to B, then the A is called the domain, and B is called the codomain. Are you equating arrows and morphisms right now? I am. <laughs> okay, some people write, think of arrows as the as part, part the of the path, that are in the path, then the, the graph. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Let's just say morphisms then. <coughs> um, so, the fact that, so, so this condition here says that the, the domain and codomain of morphisms must be preserved by a functor. So the domain of the image is the same as the image of the domain. And so what that means concretely over here is that once we pick where the arrow goes, we know where the domain and the, we have no more choices. We know where the domain has to go. It has to go to the domain of wherever the arrow went. Um, and we know where this, the codomain here has to go because it has to go to the, the codomain of wherever we, we send this arrow. Um, so we could send this arrow six different places. We could send it to the identity arrow on this object, in which case, these objects both have to go to this object. We could send it to the identity arrows on these two objects. We could send it to the identity arrow, uh, to this arrow, like the example here. We could send this arrow here, that defines a functor by, because this object has to go here and this object has to go here. And there's one more arrow, which is the path, sorry, there's one more morphism, which is the path across from here to here. So we can send this morphism here to the, the path and then this object goes to this object, and this object goes to this object. <coughs> so you're saying there are six? Oh. There are six. So in particular, given any category here, um, whether it be some sort of free category generated graph or not, the number of functors from this category here to, to the, that category over there is equal to the number of morphisms in that category. Wait, so uh, I'm, I'm curious if you don't mind. So are there not implicit like identity arrows in the two graph? Right, there are. But we, we so don't have a choice about where they go either. So say you take the morphism in two and put it, or, or map it to um, uh, the identity morphism in three, then mm -hmm. won't there be like three identical identity morphisms? Right, so oh, every, every okay. morphism okay. here, every object, if we if we map this to the identity morphism on this yeah. uh, two, Yes, yeah, so if we map this morphism here to the identity morphism on this object, yeah. then there are three morphisms in this category. They all go to the identity okay. morphism. And that's there okay. are two objects, they both go to that object. Okay. okay. Um, so for another perspective, 